Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to our second talk of the series, The Other Side of the Border, Ties That Bind and Issues That Divide, which brings together practitioners working on the border, Mexico, and Latin America. In this talk, we have the honor of hearing from Ms. Ginger Jacobs, a renowned immigration attorney in California on myth busting around immigration and asylum, an absolutely critical talk for today. The series, you should know, was organized by Assistant Professor Eileen Teague in collaboration with the Border Migrations Lab. The Border Migration Lab is a new initiative that we launched at the Mossbacher Institute last year, which has the objective of producing rigorous research on the origins and impacts of migration, economic border flows, and cultural integration, and of enhancing evidence-driven policymaking and community engagement. We promote multidisciplinary research to achieve these objectives, and we are really thrilled to have affiliated faculty from across the Texas A&M campus, including folks from sociology, political science, economics, law, and others. And I'm especially excited about introducing one of my most delightful colleagues, Dr. Eileen Teague, who will then introduce our speaker. Eileen joined our school recently. She joined the Bush School's Department of International Affairs as an assistant professor in the fall of 2020. Before that, she held a postdoctoral fellowship at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. She earned her PhD in history from Vanderbilt University in 2018. Born in Cologne, Panama, she traveled the world as part of a military family and has served in the U.S. Marine Corps from 2006 to 2014. Right now, our students are extremely lucky because she's teaching classes on American history and U.S. relations with Mexico and Latin America, as well as thematic courses addressing issues such as interventionism, drug enforcement, national security, and addiction in U.S. society. Eileen enjoys providing a voice on how history has shaped current social and political issues, and it is a true honor for the Borders of Migration Lab and the Mossbacher Institute to organize the speaker series with her to shed light on the very important issues facing the border. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Eileen to present our speaker. Thank you, Raymond. Um, welcome to everyone to our uh, second and final meeting of the other side of the border. Uh, I'm grateful to the Mossbacher Institute and the Border and Migration Lab, especially to Vivian Bronsoler and Cindy Gauss for all of your support. Uh, across this semester. For those of you joining us for the first time, what we wanted to do with the other side of the border was highlight practitioner perspectives. That is people involved in executing policy and navigating the human impacts of policymaking. Our two meetings this semester represent the pilot run of the series, which we aim to expand into an in-person capacity in future semesters so that our, our graduate students here at the Bush School can interact with practitioners working along the border in Mexico and throughout Latin America. I don't think we could complete the pilot run of this series without addressing asylum policy, especially as it involves the hundreds of thousands of migrants, including those from Northern Triangle countries, Mexico, and a host of other nations traveling northward to the United States Southern border seeking asylum. Most of these asylum claims have been denied. The administration of Donald Trump was tougher on immigration and immigrants than any administration in recent memory, making it harder for people to visit, live, or work in the United States, uh, and seeking to reduce the number of those illegally entering the country. People were also denied the opportunity to apply for asylum and return to dangerous conditions at home. Children were separated from their families in an era of border walls and extreme nativism. The Biden administration has also struggled to keep up with the influx of migrants coming to the United States southern border, particularly unaccompanied minors who have languished in border patrol stations as, a, as officials scramble to find sites to accommodate them. CBP, or U.S. Customs and Border Protection, apprehended more than 170,000 people attempting to cross the border in March 2021, a 71% increase from February, according to the agency's data. What's more, the issue of asylum has transnational consequences. In March, as reported by the New York Times, the Mexican government received asylum petitions for more than 9,000 people, the highest monthly tally ever. During our last meeting of the seminar, we took more of a border security, Washington-centered approach on the so-called border crisis with Mr. Alan Burson. Asylum uh, is a buzzword in the news media these days, but many of us have, but how many of us have actually taken the time to think about what it means in practice and execution? Well, wait no longer. I'm incredibly excited to introduce our second speaker, Ms. Ginger Jacobs. 
Ms. Jacobs practices in all areas of immigration law, though is perhaps best known for her work with vulnerable populations, including asylum seeking, uh, asylum seekers, refugees, victims of violent crimes and survivors of domestic violence. Based in San Diego, California, she is a frequent speaker on these issues locally, regionally, and nationally. She has helped hundreds of individuals and families obtain immigration relief in the United States after they have survived horrific external circumstances. Ms. Jacobs has represented asylum seekers from all over the world, including the former Soviet Union, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, and the Middle East. She has litigated cutting edge asylum claims based on gender motivated violence and LGBT status among other situations. She feels fortunate to have been of service to many individuals and families who have thrived after surviving experiences of violence. Ms. Jacobs has decades of experience practicing immigration law, though she particularly enjoys complex and cutting edge cases, including cases requiring waivers, criminal analysis, and other challenging factors. This is why I was most excited to connect with her and ask her to speak with our community here at the Bush School. These are only a few introductory tidbits in a long career dedicated to providing compassionate legal service to hundreds of individuals navigating what can be an extraordinarily complex immigration system here in the United States. I'm gonna give the floor to Ms. Jacobs for about 35 minutes, after which point we'll open up the floor for questions, which um, can be sent to me directly via private message on Zoom. Um, I've already seen a few questions pop up. Um, so as they come up, don't hesitate to send them my way. Um, Ms. Jacobs, um, Ginger, uh, I will turn the floor over to you and uh, thank you so much for speaking with us. Great, thank you so much, Eileen, and thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Uh, it's really an honor for me to um, present at such a prestigious school, and I am very excited to share what I've learned through my practice with all of you. Um, I've been practicing immigration for over 19 years, exclusively here in San Diego, right? basically right on top of the US-Mexico border. So I do have some unique perspectives as an immigration lawyer who practices right on the border. Um, my professional life is different from uh, immigration lawyers who may be practicing in other parts of the country. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about how I got into immigration law. Um, I actually graduated from Harvard Law School in 1998. Um, with cum laude honors. And uh, like most Harvard Law graduates in the 90s, I sort of gravitated to a large, uh, very corporate setting with a multinational law firm in New York. Um, I actually practiced with two large um, law firms in New York, um, where I did super fascinating things like helping corporations sue other corporations for money and uh, defending um, white collar uh, criminal defendants. That, that was actually pretty interesting. Um, but uh, I wasn't very satisfied personally with the work that I was doing. I was happy that I was in you know, um, a prestigious firm. I was happy with the money I was making. I felt like I was climbing the ladder of success, but there was something inside of me that told me I was on the wrong ladder. And I started to think about what had brought me to law school in the first place. And, so, and, and a large part of that was a strong interest that I've always had in human rights. And so while I was working as an associate attorney at Covington and Burling, I had the opportunity to take an asylum case. Um, the big firms love taking asylum cases because they give young associates practical experience in litigating a case because it's an actual courtroom case where you examine and cross-examine witnesses. So it's great prep um, for a young lawyer who's trying to learn some skills. And uh, along with a team from the firm, I represented an asylum seeker from Cameroon. Um, this gentleman had uh, fled literally with the clothes on his back and his wallet, and that was it, um, with no bag, no suitcase, no papers, no knapsack, nothing. Um, he lived in a, um, a township that was known to where it was known to be where people from his political party resided. Um, and his political party was the opposing political party to the um, administration, to the to the national government of Cameroon. So um, he was in his house one day. Um, 
doing some studying and basically government troops came in with machine guns and started shooting up the township. Um, he fled through, uh, he jumped out of a window at the back of his house, started running and basically never stopped um, until he got to the United States, which uh, by necessity involved stowing away on um, a large cargo ship that came from um, the western coast of Africa to the United States. I was working at the time in New York, so the case was based out of a detention center in New Jersey. Um, the detention center was located in a warehouse district because it was, in fact, a warehouse. Um, it was an actual warehouse in a warehouse district that looked much like any other warehouse you can imagine, corrugated metal uh, walls, but it was a warehouse for human beings. And um, we represented that case. We worked our young attorney hearts out on that case and eventually succeeded in winning the case. Um, not only did we win the case, but he was released from detention the same day. So it was such an exhilarating case for me that it made me do a lot of thinking about what I wanted to be doing with my life and what I wanted to be doing with my legal career. And shortly after that, my husband, who's also a lawyer, and I decided to relocate to San Diego for a career opportunity for him. Um, but once I arrived in San Diego, I met some members of the immigration bar and learned that asylum was actually part of their regular caseload, which is something I, I hadn't realized before. I thought that asylum cases were just done by uh, eager young pro bono associates from big law firms or nonprofits. And I didn't understand that there were you know, thousands or tens of thousands of, of attorneys working in small practices or, or small to medium sized practices who actually handled asylum cases as part of their day to day workloads. So I uh, practiced for two years with an attorney who had about a third of her cases were asylum. Um, and her office had a Russian speaking capacity. So those were a lot of the former Soviet Union cases that Eileen mentioned. Um, and then after that, I uh, joined forces with another um, young attorney and, and went out on my own in um, January of 2004. So I've had my own firm for a little over 17 years. And as Eileen mentioned, I practice in many different areas of immigration law, so I can um, speak pretty easily about a lot of different areas in case, you know, people, this comes up or if people have questions throughout the presentation, but I do love my asylum cases the most, I have to admit, because that's where my heart is. Um, it's certainly not where the money is, and that's why we do uh, immigration law for large corporations also and helping them bring people to the United States with visas so that they can uh, pursue their um, largely high tech jobs. Um, but it is, uh, I, I wouldn't practice um, immigration law if I couldn't do asylum law. It's, uh, it's truly a passion for me. Um, so how does being right here on the border, I understand that uh, a lot of you may be getting a lot of DC perspectives. And if you read about um, you know, immigration issues and asylum issues in the media uh, or watch shows that are based out of New York or based out of DC, the perspective is not always that local. So I wanna talk to you from my perspective of practicing immigration law specifically in San Diego. Um, because we do see and witness a lot right here on the border, just as you would in, in a practice in Texas, Arizona, uh, or New Mexico that's right along the border. The issues are going to be similar, uh, but they've really heated up for San Diego since 2016. So prior to 2016, we didn't see that many border asylum cases here in San Diego. Most asylum uh, cases that were along the border tended to go to the Rio Grande sector um, in Texas. And so this was, this is kind of old hat um, for the Rio Grande sector. Um, what happened in the mid um, 2010s is that um, because of the different cartel activity in Mexico, uh, the smuggling routes changed. And so a lot of people who seek asylum are brought to the US border by smugglers. Um, and so the smuggling routes changed um, because there was, you know, a lot of internal um, divisions and a, a lot of fights between the cartels. So basically that, that would be a speech in and of itself that 
um, that a different expert could give you. But the smuggling routes changed. So they moved from eastern Mexico to western Mexico because it was safer. Um, and then a large number of asylum seekers began appearing um, in San Diego in the mid 2010s. And so we really got here, we really got steeped in border specific asylum issues. Um, we have experience, I mean, I have experience, personal experience, and sometimes I say we because I represent my firm and we have a number of attorneys in my firm, but I also work with a lot of nonprofit organizations. Um, as a board member and as a mentor. So I've, I've seen, you know, all different iterations of this, but we do work with a lot of um, asylum seekers from Central America. So those would be people who traveled via land, um, often through Mexico and then coming up to the, the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, we also have seen asylum seekers from all over the world who managed to get visas to travel to Mexico uh, whereas they were denied visas to come to the U.S. So um, in, in kind of visa shopping, they um, are able to get into Mexico. They maybe say they're coming to, Me to Mexico for a vacation. And then once they arrive, they come up to the U.S.-Mexico border to apply for asylum. And we've also worked with asylum seekers from Mexico. Um, I would say that the number of asylum seekers from Mexico has died down a bit in recent years. Um, and that we are seeing more applicants from Central America, but also from other parts of the world. So you'd be surprised if you, I think if you went into um, a CBP uh, holding facility, um, I've been inside one myself to interview a client. And I kind of went in thinking I would see a lot of Spanish speaking folks. And um, it was a very mixed group of people, including some Spanish speaking folks, some people from South Asia, uh, some people from the Middle East. So it's a very, 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 the asylum seekers that we're talking about are a very diverse group. Um, you will hear a lot in the news exclusively about Central As American asylum seekers, because that is a narrow group that the Trump administration targeted. Um, with a, a policy that was called the Migrant Protection Program. I think you may have already heard about that with Alan Burson's speech. Um, but the Migrant Protection Program, which practitioners call the Remain in Mexico Program, forced asylum seekers to stay in Mexico while applying for asylum. So they would be brought into San Diego um, or maybe to another city along the southern border that had an immigration court. Um, for, a, for the day, have their court, and then they would be taken back to Mexico that same day. Of course, that all stopped with COVID. So all of those cases were basically put on hold and have been on hold for a year. Um, but that program was exclusively used with Central American asylum seekers. So if you had a uh, an asylum seeker that met a different profile, so somebody from South Asia or somebody from the Middle East, they would not have been processed through that program. It only applied to Central America. So that's why I think a lot of people have a perception that all of the asylum seekers along the southern border are from Central America. That's a myth. So part of the um, the title of my talk is myth busting. So there's one um, that we tackled right away is that a lot of border asylum seekers are, are, are from all parts of the world. Um, and so then this presents different issues, right? When you have different asylum seekers being treated in really different fashions um, and subjected to different processes and procedures, um, that's you know, you can start to think maybe there's some due process issues there. Why would asylum seekers from one country be treated differently than asylum seekers from another country? Um, and then it was particularly challenging for the asylum seekers who were forced to wait in Mexico to get counsel. So there are many reasons for that. Um, we have a uh, kind of small but scrappy immigration bar here in San Diego, but we're no Los Angeles, we're no New York. So um, we there we have immigration attorneys here in San Diego, but we're not a huge legal market. Uh, so there's already a limit on you know resources on counsel who are available. Um, immigration attorneys have to charge for cases. Uh, it's an unfortunate 
fact, but it's one that's true. Um, the only way that I make money is by charging people money for my time. You know, that's that's it. That's the only service or, or commodity that we have to offer as attorneys, right, is our time. Uh, just like people who are in the public policy sector, um, you're not selling a product, you're just selling your time. So if you're spending your time on something, you have to charge for it. Um, we do have some nonprofits here in town. Many of us do take pro bono cases, but we can't, you can't have a practice that consists entirely of pro bono unless you're independently wealthy, um, in which case you, you know, you're probably not an immigration lawyer in San Diego because I don't know anybody who meets that <laughs> who meets that cr that criteria. Um, and then the other thing that was the most complicated piece of this is that U.S. licensed attorneys are not licensed to practice law in Mexico. So if we, let's say we're, and we we had this issue um, up you know up front and central, we did uh, take on a pro bono case for a. Uh, a woman who's in, who was in the MPP program originally from Central America, you know, put into the MPP program. She had a particularly compelling case. Um, and, and there was a story written about her in the San Diego Union Tribune by a very reputable reporter who had actually gone to the home country and investigated the case and had verified that what the client was saying was true. So we had, you know, a very, very good reason to believe that it was a strong case and that the client was being truthful. Um, so we agreed to take her case pro bono, but we couldn't go to Mexico to meet her because nobody in my firm is licensed to practice law in Mexico and it would be illegal. Um, a lot of um, kind of more activist groups took the position that, oh, well, you know, I have to follow my conscience. And there were some people who did um, go to Mexico to meet with clients and essentially practice law in Mexico. Um, and then the U.S. government actually started targeting them um, and, and then engaging in punitive um, measures against those people. So uh, there are a number of what well, I'll say more activist attorneys who were put on a kind of wanted list or a watch list um, by the Department of Homeland Security and then began to have trouble. For example, uh, there was a, an attorney um, colleague who went with her husband and child to Mexico for vacation um, and then was denied entry um, to Mexico for a vacation because of her activities, uh, because she'd been placed on that watch list for practicing law without a license in Mexico. So that's just one of the barriers that the people in the, the MPP program faced. They were just, so we, we kind of sat here helplessly in San Diego with thousands upon thousands of people with cases mounting up, mounting up, um, the border, I'm in my house right now. You can see I'm in my home office. The border is 17 miles from my house. Um, here in San Diego, we don't have a San Diego Chamber of Commerce. We have a San Diego Tijuana Regional Chamber of Commerce. San Diego and Tijuana are like a met one metropolitan area. So it's it was a very weird and almost artificial construct for somebody who is in a border area to suddenly see, okay, there are tens of thousands of people less than 20 miles from my house who desperately need legal services and I legally can't provide them. We did do some workarounds. We did represent the client uh, that I mentioned, but all of our conversations had to be over the phone or via, via video conference. Keep in mind, this was pre-pandemic, so we were not as used to working with clients that way. I mean, now we're really used to working with clients that way, so maybe we wouldn't be so shy about that kind of an engagement now that we're more used to working with people um, using technology, um, but we still haven't met her in person. We've never met her in person, which is very unusual um, in my line of business. We usually are sitting down with our clients, talking face to face, crying together. You know, this, this is all pre pandemic, you know, comforting each other, sending, you know, handing a tissue um, as the person's telling 
us their story and to not have that, um, you know, has been really challenging. But anyway, so being here on the border um, does give me a unique perspective. I don't just, I don't know what's happening because I see it on TV. I know it's happening because I see it in my community and my colleagues and my friends um, are going through it as well. And we're all seeing it. We can share, hey, I was down in TJ yesterday and I was with over at this migrant shelter and this is what was going on and this is what they were struggling with. Um, so I've got that, you know, eyes on the ground, boots on the ground focus. I'm also um, on the board of a, a migrant shelter here in San Diego. And um, from time to time, I go over to the shelter, meet with people, talk to people there. So I learn, you know, what they've been through, what they've been going through, why they're why they're here, why they're seeking asylum. So I get a lot of in-person exposure uh, to these issues. Um, it's really important when you're thinking about policy issues to remember that these are people, right? So at the end of the day, when you're sitting down and when you're sitting face to face with somebody and they're telling you what happened to them or what happened to their child or what happened to their spouse, you don't go, oh yeah, well, why didn't you apply for a visa? You, you know, the way that we maybe dialogue um, when there's like a debate style show on the news or back and forth on Twitter or Facebook or something, or yeah, well, why didn't you just stay home and fight the government of your country? You know, you don't say that to like a mom who's sitting there crying because her son was murdered. And so when you're um, taking on these issues from a public policy perspective, when you're working in think tanks and for government agencies, and you're trying to think about policies that involve immigrants and asylum seekers, I encourage you to think about everyone we're talking about here, asylum seekers, you say tens of thousands, tens of thousands of people. Oh my goodness, that's thousands of families. Their families are just like my family, right? So especially here in San Diego, where um, we're a um, majority minority um, area, uh, white people are minority here in San Diego because they're, we are such an immigrant heavy and a refugee heavy community. The, the people that we're talking about, asylum seekers, immigrants, refugees, they're my neighbors. They're my closest friends. Their kids are best friends with my daughter. They're teachers in my school. And we don't always get that perspective when we live in a different part of the country, maybe, where the exposure to people who've been through these situations um, is, is not as constant as it is right here in an area like San Diego. So San Diego is not only, you would imagine, okay, it's heavy, heavy Mexican-American population, definitely is, but we have a huge Somali population. We have a huge Iraqi population. Um, we have people from all over the world. We have a big Cambodian population. So I just, you know, uh, refugee communities form up by somebody comes here first. And then when somebody else is fleeing, they want to go where they know someone. So they go to the same town, village or city where their cousin is. And then it follows and it builds that way. So why is there a huge Hmong community and in Minneapolis, you know, because somebody went there first and then friends followed and then cousins followed and neighbors followed, just like anything else, just like when, you know, um, the U.S. became the U.S. and, and, and people moved westward. Um, so uh, one of the things that's unique about being on the border is that a deportation can happen within a couple of hours. So for my friends who are pra practicing immigration law in other parts of the country, um, they may get notice, oh my gosh, my loved one is going to be deported. Um, it's going to take place in a week. You know what? Lucky lawyer. They have a whole week to try to stop that deportation. They have a whole week to file a stay, to file a brief, to try to file some sort of an emergency petition. Um, by the time somebody calls me, if the if the client is from Mexico and says my spouse is about to be deported, by the time I can even get the phone call, maybe call DHS, send over uh, evidence of my representation, the person may be gone because they literally put them in a car, drive them across the border and let them out. 
So deportations can happen fast, um, which means, practically speaking, going back to centering ourselves around people, a family can be split up like that. A parent can be gone like that. Um, and so you see a lot of traumatized children um, who wake up in the morning, mom and dad are there, they come home from school and a parent is gone. And now that parent is in another country. Um, it's pretty horrifying from a kid's perspective. And a lot of the families I've worked with, the kids have developed pretty serious uh, mental health and physical health issues. Because if you imagine yourself being in their shoes, imagine, imagine yourself being a child or imagine yourself being a teenager. And from morning to afternoon, your parents gone. And it's, you know, it's not temporary. It's not like, oh, um, you know, they're on a work trip. They'll be back in a week or something like they're in another country and they have no way to come back to the United States. And maybe, maybe it's your dad that's gone and your mom can't take you to visit him because she's undocumented. So she can't take you across the border. So maybe you don't see your dad for years. These are real life tragedies that we see. Um, so I think it's very easy to kind of look at immigration as an abstract issue, um, but I don't see it as an abstract issue. I see it as a person by person, family by family issue. And these are the folks that I'm dealing with. Um, so I, I, uh, I think that we, if we center ourselves around the universality of family, we can come to better decisions as policymakers, as government officials about how to handle these cases. Um, quickly, uh, I just want to um, explain what the difference is between an immigrant and a asylee or an asylum seeker and a refugee. So if you are in a position in the future to be using these terms in your job, you use them correctly. Um, an immigrant is somebody who is coming to the United States because of pull factors. There's something that they're coming towards. They're being pulled or drawn to the United States. Usually they're coming here for to join family. Um, they may be coming to work. They may be coming to go to school and then end up loving it here and decide to stay and try to pursue their career here in the United States. So immigrants are people who voluntarily come to the United States. So I have the chat open for a reason. And I want to see if anybody, you know, has an idea as, as to why I'm going to say this. You know how people often say, like, unless your ancestors were Native Americans, they were immigrants. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with the statement? Unless your ancestors were Native Americans, they were immigrants. Does anybody have a guess that they could put in the chat? No? Either I'm not seeing them or nobody's answering. They didn't have pull factors. Many were brought as slaves. Lots of people were brought here against their will. Exactly. If your ancestors were brought here against their will, if they were kidnapped and brought here, they didn't come voluntarily. So there, with immigration, there's a voluntary element to it. You are coming, you are relocating, you are making a choice to change your residence. Okay? So then when we think about, so that's why when I talk about, because it is really important for us to think about our own ancestors. I think when we're judging other people's behavior, right? So like a lot of white people like to say things like, well, my ancestors came legally. Um, and we can get into in a second, what's wrong with that? Um, and I would love to, but let me finish this point first. Um, people often snap back quickly with saying, well, unless you were a Native American, you're an immigrant too. Um, descendants of enslaved people are not derived from immigrants, right? Okay, so we got that, that's clear, yeah? Um, lots of people were brought here against their will, that's exactly it. Now, refugees often don't like to be referred to as immigrants. 
and it goes along with those push and pull factors. So remember, immigrants came because they wanted to, right? They, they wanted to join. Oh, my uncle lives in Chicago. I'd love to go there and join him and work with him. It's going to be awesome. Refugees come because they're forced to, refugees and asylum seekers. And I'll explain the difference between the two. But let's just talk about these are the people that come because of push factors. They are being pushed out of their country. So did you guys get a chance, I can see some of your faces, but not all, to read the poem that I circulated um, with the invitation? Right, so when, and then there was also a YouTube link where she, where you hear the author's voice. It was really powerful, right? Where she says, basically like, nobody, nobody leaves home you know, and this means against their will, like parentheses, against their will, unless home is the mouth of a shark, right? People love home, right? People love home. Home is home. When you're, when you're super jazzed and motivated to go somewhere and you're an immigrant, that's cool. You still love home, but you also want to go and explore something else. But what if you're a person and you love home and you can't be at home anymore because it's not safe? right? You can't be at home anymore because you might get killed. You can't be at home anymore because your kids might get killed, which as a parent is far worse than you yourself getting killed, right? Anybody here who's a parent knows what I'm talking about. You can't be there anymore because you might get tortured. You could go into jail. There are places, there are countries on, on this planet where you go to jail and you're never seen or heard from again. That's it. Your family might as well have a funeral just right then and there. One of those countries is the Democratic Republic of Congo. I've represented people from there. It is literally the stuff of horror movies. If I told you the stories, you would think I was lying, but I'm not. These are real things that happen to real people. Torture, systemic sexual abuse, um, like multiple hours of sexual abuse per day happening to female prisoners. Um, and these people are taken prisoner, not because they broke the law, but because they were part of the wrong political party or because they were the wrong ethnicity, you know, something about themselves they couldn't change. So people who come to the United States from backgrounds like that, they're not coming because they think they're going to get some cool new job or because they got into Harvard or Texas A&M Bush School and they're really excited about it. They're coming because they have no other choice. They are being forced to leave their home country because it is, it is simply too dangerous, right? So they're being pushed. Okay, so think about immigration, immigration, those pull factors. People are coming here for something really cool. Push factors, they are being pushed out. All right, refugees, and this is super simple. Refugees are people who leave their home country they go to a third country, a third country where there is a United Nations office or a United Nations refugee camp. And they are given refugee status. They're given the designation of refugee by the United Nations. And then they are resettled to a safe country. So if you meet somebody who tells you that they are a refugee or their parents were refugees, that means that they were already screened for status before they ever set foot on the United States soil. Part of that process involves very extensive background checks, including criminal background checks, um, membership in a terrorist organization, and it even involves fact checking on their case. So an officer from the UN may go out and do some recon and interview people and see if their story is true. Those people are heavily vetted. So if you meet somebody who is a refugee and they were resettled here, they've been vetted up, down, left, right, 16 ways, okay? It's probably more than 16, actually. The number of background checks they go through is very extensive. So if you ever hear something in the news or, oh, these refugees, they're unvetted, blah, 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 you know that's false. 
Okay, just right away, you know that's false because the UN goes through an extremely extensive vetting process. Then the UN recommends them for resettlement. And they, they usually pick the country based on where that person has relatives or where there's a community of other people from that country or other people from, let's say, their ethnic group or clan or tribe where they can try to uh, you know, join up with a community of people who may be similar to them and um, have a support system for starting a new life. So that's why, for example, in San Diego, there's a huge community of Iraqi refugees. Uh, there's a huge community of Somali refugees because these were people who were in camps designated by the UN to be refugees, screened, and then given plane tickets to San Diego. Asylum seekers are people who have not been screened before. They somehow make their way to the United States. And once they have their tippy tippy toes on US soil, they apply for asylum in the US under US law. The standards for getting the benefit are the same for refugees and asylees in terms of what they have to prove, but the mechanism for how they get that benefit is very, very different. So if you're somebody coming to the US and you're seeking asylum, you, the first time you tell your story is going to be to a US government official, not to the UN, okay? As, at least as part of your application. People who are inside the United States already, so let's say you came on a student visa or you came on a tourist visa, once you got here, you realized, oh my gosh, things, I escaped a terrible situation or maybe your parents call you, you're here on a student visa and they say things got really bad at home sweetheart, you can't come back here. Um, so people who are already in the United States, they submit an asylum application to an asylum office and they go to the asylum office and they have an interview. It's non-adversarial, there's no judge. It's an officer, maybe wearing a suit, people are sitting around a desk and the officers often have a lot of like trauma-informed training, they're pretty kind, they're pretty chill, they ask a lot of questions about the situation that the person is fleeing, and um, it's, a, it's an environment that's, I think, conducive for the most part for people to tell their stories. When people come up to the border and they don't have a visa, or they don't have any other way of getting into the United States, then they go through a completely different process. So the first step in that process is that they have to have what's called a credible fear interview. Uh, a credible fear interview is traditionally conducted by an asylum officer. The asylum officer sits down with the person. They ask a very extensive set of questions. And if the person can respond to those questions and explain their story, and if the story is credible, the officer can determine, okay, this person has made enough of a showing that they can be then moved on to have a hearing. The officer may say, you know, I'm sorry, I talked to this person, I interviewed them, uh, but there's just not enough there. Like, I don't understand why they're afraid. They didn't really explain it to me in a way um, that's convincing, or maybe the reason they're afraid doesn't fit in with asylum law like they're afraid of, let's say a personal enemy um, because they stole that person's girlfriend or something. That's not a reason for asylum. You know, it doesn't fit within one of the categories for asylum. So that officer has a lot of power in sort of deciding whether the person gets to move forward in the process or not. Um, once the officer, let's assume our, our applicant does uh, get uh, passed along through the system, they're, they are determined to have a credible fear. Uh, that's just the first step. And then they go on to have a court case. When its asylum application is in court, uh, this is an adversarial process. There's essentially a prosecutor, a defense attorney, a judge in a robe, and it's a very intimidating situation. So uh, it's definitely a different process than going to the asylum office. Now, one of the things that people, um, have are confused about is um, do people actually show up for their 
asylum hearings. Um, do anybody want to put in the chats? Uh, let's see. I'm going to think the statistics are different, but let's say just generally, what percentage do you guys think, or based on what you've heard in the media, what percentage of asylum seekers appear in court all the way through the process, all the way to receiving a final decision on their claims? Anyone have a guess? Okay. We've got a bunch of different numbers, 32, 91, 58, 75, 40, less than 10. Oh, lots of great answers. So the person who said 91% is the one who's right. So someone's well-informed. 92% um, uh, of asylum seekers appear in court to receive a final decision on their claim. So people, when you hear on the news or we hear people talking or analysts or whatever, saying the problem with asylum is these people get admitted into the United States, they get paroled in, and then they just disappear like they're ghosts or something. You hear that a lot on the news, right? You know, I have to like have my mute button um, in my hand when I'm watching the news on immigration stuff to just mute when somebody starts going off and saying something that's not true. 92% of asylum seekers appear in court to receive a final decision on their claims. And when those people are represented, so when they're actually able to get an attorney, that number skyrockets to 98%, right? So that makes sense. Like if you have counsel and you have a lawyer saying, hey, you better be in court. If you don't show up, you're gonna get deported in your absence, then 98% of asylum seekers do show up in court. Um, so that's just one of those, another one of those myths that I'm happy to bust. Um, one of the things that, oh, so we, we talked about immigrant versus refugee versus asylee. So we're clear on those terms. We understand a little bit more about the asylum process and how it works. It is not an easy process. Um, if you guys can imagine yourselves in those situations, having to be in a court setting that's much like a criminal court with the Department of Homeland Security attorney sitting in the prosecutor seat, you in the defendant seat, essentially. So it's set up very much like a criminal case, even though it's technically a civil case. Um, so it's, it's definitely an intense process. There are many layers of vetting that go that happen throughout the process. People are fingerprinted, um, that they do background checks, criminal, they run them through not just US you know, criminal background, but also worldwide. So sometimes we'll find out that somebody has a warrant in another country or, or Interpol has a notice on them or something like that. So they go through international background check. Um, so I, we talked about some myths about asylum seekers. Um, Myths about the immigration process. I'm going to address overall. I know we we're focused more on asylum, but I wanted to quickly address one of the biggest myths about immigration. Um, so have you guys ever heard anybody refer to to saying like, I don't understand why people come to the U.S. illegally. They just need to get in line. All right. Does anybody have a sense or an understanding as to how easy that is or how hard that might be? Because you know I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, it takes years. Exactly. It takes years. So I'm going to tell you about a close family friend of ours. Um, she was brought to the United States as a child um, from Mexico. Yeah, her mom um, is a single parent family. Mom was working in the United States, sending money back home to the family in Mexico. And this friend of mine was born in Mexico. Um, mom filed for her when she was a little kid. Okay. Mom became, because mom became a lawful permanent resident through the amnesty. That's the most important thing first. There was a big amnesty in the 1980s. Um, people attribute it to Ronald Reagan because he was the president that. Uh, signed off on the bill, but it was a bipartisan effort in Congress. Um, it's the last time we've had a big amnesty. So it, that's, you know, we're getting, we're getting on 40 years. So imagine the number of people that have accumulated waiting for another amnesty since that one. 
Um, so mom, her mom got her green card through the amnesty. She filed for my friend and it took my friend. She got her green card this year, 23 years. She was in line for 23 years. So, so there's a combination of factors. The lines are different lengths, depending on what country you come from. The longest lines are for people from Mexico, the Philippines, India, and China. It's because those are the four countries that send the most immigrants to the United States. And it's a per country number of green cards. So if you happen to have been born in Mexico, your line might be 23 years. And if you happen to have been born in Belize, your line might be five years. It's per country. So the biggest centers of immigrants get the longest lines. It's not an easy process at all. Um, and that I was going to address quickly the idea that people say of, well, my ancestors came legally, like that old, that old line, my ancestors came legally. Um, back when our many of our ancestors came, there weren't 23 year long lines. Okay. Like you pretty much, if you were white, you pretty much just showed up. You would go through an interview the day you showed up or within a couple of days of showing up. Um, they would make sure you didn't have a communicable disease. They would ask you some questions. Did you have some place to go like a sponsor? Cause they didn't want you, you know to not have anywhere to go. So if you were, um, and, and I'm not saying this because I'm being political but it literally was the way the immigration law was written. If you were white, it specifically said white, um, and you came to the United States, you hopped on a boat, you arrived, Ellis Island, Statue of Liberty, it's very glamorized, right? Like in movies and stuff, it's really cool. Um, then you would be let in. So when you say like, well, my ancestors came legally, what's wrong with you people? You gotta think about the difference in effort that it takes to just get on a boat and show up or to have to wait in line for 23 years. And if you're faced with the prospect of being separated from your mother and you don't have a dad because it's a single parent family for 23 years, what are you gonna do? What would any of us do? So with that, those are just, I know we went over a ton in a really short period of time. I have a lot to share. I'm really happy for questions. And I also wanted to let you know that I'm really happy to stay later. For me, it's the middle of the afternoon because I'm in California. So I'm willing to stay here and answer people's questions or talk to students about their interests for as long as you guys want to go. I know that they are going to turn off, like sort of shut down the official piece of this at around 715. Um, but we can keep on talking. All right. So with that... I will go I ahead and uh, and yeah. moderate <laughs> moderate the discussion um, and maybe give you a break to take a, a couple of sips of uh, of water. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, we, we have uh, quite a list of questions that I'm happy to go through, but uh, as the moderator, I want to um, take uh, advantage of the opportunity to ask the first question, Ginger. And um, the first question I have is um, about. Central American migrants um, in particular. Um, and I'm wondering if, I mean, a lot of times um, the imagination around uh, refugees is, I mean, someone coming from some type of you know, war zone and that affords a certain amount of compassion for entry into the United States. And I'm wondering if for some reason, um, are the types of violence that asylum seekers from Central America and Mexico and the types of violence that they're experiencing is that violence somehow um, seen as less dangerous um, to, um, you know, less as a war zone um, to the way that the, the system is currently designed? Um, and I know people have a lot of, uh, I mean, Americans have a lot of fears of, you know, of, of migrants coming from, from Latin America, from Central America, um, from Mexico. Um, and I'm wondering if with the Biden administration coming in, um, and these are perhaps two big questions that I know students have um, bits that they probably want to ask on those. But I mean, is there any sort of what sorts of revisions do you need to uh, 
do you need to see being made at the top in order to make this process more, um, you know, more just and equitable? That was like 16 questions packed into one. So I'm going to try to typical <laughs> academic, you know, but let's, uh, okay. Bottom line questions. Um, yes. So Central American migrants, are they treated differently because they're not coming from a legitimate war zone? And what policies do we need to see made at the top uh, right. to make your job easier? So I would argue that they actually are coming from war zones, a lot of the clients that I've worked with, but it's just a war zone that looks different than other war zones. So I have actually handled quite a few asylum cases from Mexico, and they basically all follow kind of the following basic fact pattern. Um, somebody gets somehow mixed up um, in some kind of violent encounter with a cartel. So it could be that they witnessed, they were like minding their own business, driving down the street, and they witnessed the cartel like kidnapping someone. That's what happened to one of my clients. Um, one of my clients, he hired a smuggler um, because he was desperate to come back to the United States and rejoin his family. And right now the smugglers aren't just smugglers, they're cartels. So he accidentally saw a bunch of like drug running and then um, he later was in an accident in the United States and Border Patrol convinced him to testify against the cartel. So um, these guys are very, very, very afraid in Mexico specifically of cartels. The thing is, is that uh, U.S. Um, asylum law is set up to help people who are afraid of the government of their country. In Mexico, the government or police officers or members of the military and the cartels are virtually indistinguishable. So all of my clients who've been through situations like this have shared stories that the, um, let's say they witnessed a cartel violence. Um, they were identified, like I have one guy, he's like a real upstanding guy. So he witnessed a kidnapping. He called the police like, oh my God, I just witnessed a kidnapping. Please send, you know, send your cars out. This young lady was just, they were trying to kidnap her. And um, the police were like, okay, what's your name? What's your address? Blah, blah, blah. Creepy people start showing up at his address. And he eventually gets kidnapped and tortured, like very, very severely tortured. He still has a ton of PC PTSD symptoms to this day. And from what he was able to see of, um, like the car that he was kidnapped in, the boots, the pants of the people that um, tortured him is that it was the police. So the cartels and the government are not separate entities. And I think that's something that's really important for people to understand because if they think like, oh, gang violence, well, we have gang violence here or, you know, um, that, okay, well here, okay, we can call the police, right? And we can be reasonably assured, not always, but reasonably, assure, uh, uh, reasonably sure that the police are not the same as the gangs or as the cartels or as the, the bad guys, right? If we witness something and we call the police, we don't think, okay, my calling the police means that the police are gonna send a bunch of goons out to my house to try to shut me up. That's what they're going through there. So the the government and the organized crime are indistinguishable. So they are fleeing governmental violence. So it's kind of a myth that they're fleeing third party violence when that violence is just, it's just so intertwined. It's essentially the same entity. Um, so to them, to somebody living in that situation, when you're living in a place where people are getting gunned down, how is that different than a war zone, right? I mean, um, it's, it is, it is a war zone. It is a war zone for the people living there. And um, I, I can just give you example after example of the Central American cases, but a lot of them involve that kind of, um, uh, what's the word, I'm, cooperation, okay, between the government and the cartels or the gangs. Also, people are fleeing um, gender and LGBTQ-based violence. So imagine, you can see on the news right now 
how hard it is to be like, let's say a trans kid in the United States. They're like governments that are trying to kick you out of sports and like make you use the wrong bathroom and like all this crap. Like it's really hard to be a trans person in the United States. Can you imagine how hard it would be to be a trans person in Guatemala? Like it's, I mean, if it's that hard and people are actually having like lawmakers villainize them here in the US, which is the most democratic country in the world, how hard would it be to be like an LGBTQ kid in a place where um, there's so much systemic violence against people like you? Um, so we've worked with a lot of LGBTQ, including trans, but also in, in, including queer people from Central America who've just faced absolutely horrific um, violence, persecution, torture, even by their own families. So I have a client, actually he's from Africa, but I have a client whose family members beat him so badly because he was gay when he was a little kid that he lost a testicle. Like we have a medical report in his case substantiating that it was that bad, like the abuse that he was put through just merely for being gay. Um, so these are, these are real situations. These are people who could lose their lives and that's why they're fleeing. So it doesn't have to be a war zone. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, with my age, I look at like Bosnia, you know, as being kind of the, that quintessential example from when I was a young person. Um, my husband's Jewish. It doesn't have to be the Holocaust. If you're fleeing because you think you're going to be killed, your kid's going to be killed. Um, does it really matter who is perpetrating the violence if it's that level of violence and you cannot get help anywhere? So that's the important piece of asylum. If your government can help you, if your government can come in and be like, all right, kiddo, you're going to be okay. We're going to get a restraining order. We're going to arrest the person who hurt you. You know, this sucks. We're going to get you counseling. You're going to be all right, right? That's what would happen if like some, you know, because this stuff happens everywhere, right? People are, um, people are hurt. People are persecuted because of who they are. But if something like that happens to a kid in Sweden, like they're going to get services. They're going to get help. Somebody's going to help them. In many other countries in the world, nobody's going to help them. And they'll just continue to be persecuted throughout their entire lives. So one of the things that I want people to understand about asylum is that asylum is not only about people who are going to be hurt by their governments. It's also about people who are going to be hurt by private individuals. And that is contemplated within asylum law. And that was contemplated in the United Nations declaration um, that established the whole refugee framework. So under international law, both international law and US law, asylum includes violence or fear of violence by private actors. And I think that that's something that's pretty poorly understood. And there's like a really good reason for it, right? Because if, if you're in a country where your government can help you, you don't get asylum. You lose your case. There's a reason we don't have a lot of, you don't see a lot of people from Sweden getting granted asylum. But if your government can't help you, if your government is helpless, if your government doesn't have the resources or your government simply doesn't care or your government kind of doesn't like people like you, you're not going to get any help. You're not going to get any protection. So you feel that you have to go somewhere else. Okay. Well, I don't want to monopolize the time, the Q&A time with my second big question. I, I'd like to pass on to uh, open it up to some of the students questions. And the first question that, that popped up is from one of our graduate students, <coughs> Um, who asks, um, Ginger, do you believe that the Remain in Mexico policy um, is a viable option for asylum seeking individuals? Um, how could the Remain in Mexico policy be altered to provide better protections to vulnerable uh, populations? That's a great question. Um, I do not believe that the Remain in Mexico program is humane, and I do believe that it should be eliminated. So I don't believe that it could be reformed um, unless we had really massively significant and expensive intervention um, by either the US government or the United Nations. Um, the Remain in Mexico program has been extremely difficult for the people in the program um, because they came here seeking asylum, planning to seek asylum. 
um, and they didn't necessarily come with any resources. And so many of them are living in subhuman conditions um, in camps, no water, no basically no significant shelter, no food, um, horrible sanitation. And so um, how could you even be working on mounting a legal strategy when your living conditions are that horrible? Um, remain in Mexico violates international law. So under international law, the United States is not permitted to expel people to a country or a place where they will be persecuted. Um, it's a principle called non refoulement. It's originally a, a concept in the French language. It's been part of international customary international law for centuries. And so you cannot, as a country, you're violating international law if you push people into a country where they're gonna be persecuted. Um, the Remain in Mexico migrants systemically have been persecuted in Mexico. Um, many of them have been victims of kidnapping. Many of them have been victims of extortion. Many of them have been become victims of the cartels. The LGBTQ folks have been, again, persecuted in Mexico because they're LGBTQ. Um, Women who are fleeing abusive partners um, are not safe from their partners because the partners can come and reach them in Mexico um, if, if, that's, if domestic violence is the basis of their claim. So they're really not safe in Mexico and Mexico um, doesn't have a very robust asylum program. I do appreciate hearing that they are receiving more asylum applications. But in my experience working with people who've been through Mexico, and this is again, 20 years of experience, um, Mexico is like, send them on, get them out of here, keep them moving. The US will deal with that. We don't have the resources to deal with that, not our problem. And so Mexico, the Mexican government has basically just shuffled people on to the US. And I had a group of of asylum seekers um, really early on in my practice who were originally detained by immigration in Mexico. And they basically were like, we're fleeing from our country, we're really afraid. And the Mexican government said, okay, well, if you provide um, like testimony against your smugglers, we'll give you a free airplane ride to the US border so you can go ask for asylum in the US. So basically Mexico doesn't wanna deal with these people. Um, the only possibility I could see that would be humane if the US insists on not taking people into the US would be if there were organized refugee camps along the lines of what UNHCR has set up in countries like Kenya, where they're actually people have shelter, food, water, lavatories, schools, and things like that. But the US got, or the U Mexican government would have to agree to that. And I don't know that they're interested in having UNHCR refugee camps in Northern Mexico. It's not a good look. Um, and it creates a lot of pro problems. And I think there'd be a lot of not in my backyard response from Mexican citizens and voters. So it's all political, right? And so, um, you know, they don't want, they really don't want these guys. They don't want them in their backyard. The only reason they consented to having the Remain in Mexico program was because the US strong armed them and threatened to cut off aid and stuff like that if they didn't do it. So Mexico's not happy to have them why can't they come into the United States? Like what's so bad about having them apply for asylum from within the United States? Mm. I don't know what's so bad about it. I don't know why we need remain in Mexico. And I do onto the danger point. I was ready for this question and I did my homework. So I really have to share this because I did my homework. Okay. All right. So I want so I'm going to give you two statistics, and then I want people to guess what the answer is on the third statistic. So, okay, this is the the odds of the odds of being assaulted by a gun in the United States are one in three hundred and fifteen. Okay, the odds of being the victim of a mass shooting in the United States are one in. 11,125. Okay, so just for background. Does anyone have a guess? 
as to what the odds are of dying in an attack by an asylum seeker. One out of 35, okay. So we had assault by gun, one in 315, mass shooting, one in 11,000. The chance of dying in an attack, one in a million, that's a good guess. You're getting closer, one in a million. Okay, you guys ready for this? Remember this when you go on and have really important jobs. One in 1.285 billion, billion. There is essentially no risk, or at least we can call it negligible, that you may be killed by an asylum seeker in the United States. This is not a dangerous population. These are the people fleeing the mouth of the shark. These are not the sharks, okay? Also, they go through background checks, they get screened, they get their fingerprints run. And if they're dangerous, guess where they're kept during their asylum seeking process? In a detention center which is the equivalent of a medium security prison, okay? So if there is somebody who's dangerous or there is somebody we think is dangerous or the person has a criminal record or we think they might be in a terrorist organization, they're sitting in a detention center the whole time through the whole process. They're not out mixing and mingling. The people who are out, the people who are paroled in are families, their kids, their moms with kids, their dads with kids, they're young people, they're people who are fleeing the jaws of the shark, okay? I'm not an open borders person. You know, this is not my political point of view. This is all based in research and life experience. Um, I do think that a country should have a say in who comes and, and stays in their country. I think people should be screened. I think there should be background checks. We don't have to say yes to everybody. We're under no obligation to say yes to everybody. But when you've got all these people, the people that I've worked with, women, children, families, fleeing, death, torture, rape, and the statistics show they're no harm to anybody, why are we making them stay in Mexico? Why are we only making the Central Americans stay in Mexico and not people from other countries? I don't know the answer to that question. Somebody said xenophobia. Good guess. Politics? Yep. Yeah. People are, politicians are, mm -hmm. taking advantage of people who've been misinformed or don't have the full picture, don't know the statistics, don't know the numbers, and they're feeding them lines, right? And they're saying, we have to do this because of this. And if maybe you just say, oh, that sounds right to me. Good answer. I don't want to be killed by a, you know, asylum seeker, Jesus. Well, who's more of a risk to me than an asylum seeker? Probably someone from here in San Diego, right? So I don't believe that remain in Mexico should remain. Hmm. I want to say very quickly that we are at 715, um, but I want to, there's a lot of questions here. Um, and so for those of you who um, want to continue to speak with um, Ms. Jacobs, um, we'll invite you to stick around and we'll leave the question and open room open for another 20 minutes or so. Um, so I just want to say that this will be a formal, formal conclusion to the, the presentation, but clearly there's a lot more to talk about. Um, and the, for the next question that's come up, and I'm going to kind of synthesize the questions of a couple of our graduate students um, about um, what you are hoping to see with respect to asylum policy and dealing with the, um, the overflow of asylum policy or of asylum seekers at the border right now. And 
you know, what types of measures you'd like to see the incoming Biden or the, the Biden administration take um, against, you know, sort of the fact that there's an overflow of the system, the system itself um, needs to be revised. Um, can you share any thoughts you might have about what you'd like to see in political yeah, leaders? Abs absolutely. That's a great question. And I really do see, and I've seen this now for 19 years of practice, that the asylum offices are severely underfunded and they're severely understaffed. So even when you have um, somebody who comes into the United States, let's say with a visa, and then applies for asylum, sends in their asylum application, it can take multiple years for them to get an interview. And then it can take multiple more years for them to get their approval. Um, that is pure like lack of funding, lack of staffing. There are not enough asylum officers. Maybe a lot of people like you guys who are studying public, public policy would be interested in being asylum officers. Like that would be a fascinating job, right? There are probably a lot of people who would like to have that job. It's a pretty well-paid position. It's really interesting. You meet people from all over the world and they, they tell you their stories. Um, it's dr drastically underfunded. Um, and we say, well, you know, budget's tight, blah, blah, blah. You go through this exercise all the time, probably in your classes. Well, what is the size of the US budget and how much is devoted to this and that and the other thing? And the truth is, is that the budget is vast, right? So if we spent more money on hiring more asylum officers so that we could process the cases faster and kind of move people through and get them on their way, it would be like the teeniest, tiniest sliver of the actual budget. Right. You guys could tell me more about that sometime um, about how that actually works. But just funding, you know, doubling, tripling, quadrupling the number of asylum officers we have would cost next to nothing compared to the size of the budget. You need we need more asylum offices in geographically diverse locations like right now, um, people who have an asylum case that comes up in Hawaii have. I'm pretty sure Hawaii is assigned to San Diego. So like. There's no asylum office in Hawaii. If you're an asylum seeker and maybe you're somebody who doesn't have a lot of money, how are you gonna fly to San Diego for your interview? And what if you have to get re-interviewed? Or then what if you have to come back to pick up your decision? Or what if you have to come back and get re-fingerprinted? Like nobody has, you know, asylum seekers don't have that kind of money. That's crazy. So geographically diverse, diversify the asylum officers. There are USCIS offices located all over the country. What if they all had like a little asylum subdivision with specially trained officers? You know, you wouldn't have to build a whole bunch of new buildings. They're already there. There are big USCIS offices in virtually every state. You could add, you know, an asylum, a mini asylum office right there within USCIS. You could take some of the same officers and retrain them to be asylum officers. Um, it's that would move things along. I've got a guy, he's been waiting. We, he came as, I think, on a student visa. He's gay. He's from Egypt. Imagine how that would go over in Egypt. Um, he's been waiting, I think, since 2013 for his interview. Nothing. Crickets. So we definitely need more resources. Put asylum officers, highly trained asylum officers at the border interviewing people. This is what these guys are trained to do. They get trauma-informed training. They get uh, legal training to understand, you know, what the different legal concepts are and what they should be looking for. Um, they, when, when we first started seeing, you know, this big uh, influx of asylum seeking folks in the San Diego area in the mid 2010s, they just took everybody out of our um, asylum office in Orange County and they detailed them to the border. So then guess what? There weren't any officers up in Orange County to keep interviewing those folks. We don't even have an asylum office in San Diego. Like that's how kind of ridiculously underfunded this is. If we really care about this issue, instead of coming up with like crazy schemes like remain in Mexico and like all these weird, you know, xenophobe, like somebody else suggested xenophobic programs, just treat it like any other governmental issue we're trying to solve. How do you so, how do you resolve most governmental issues? Money? 
that sound right? Like we've got this problem. You guys are the public policy people. How do we how do we solve it? We put, you know, more staff, more education, more resources. What is what's what's that? Dollar signs. So, I think if the US government actually really truly has the will to resolve this issue, they could do it pretty quickly. I mean, I I snapped my finger. That was maybe a mistake. I resent my snap. But <laughs> they could resolve it pretty quickly. It's not hard to find people who want to be asylum officers. It's there are great people out there. A guy who was an intern in my office, he was absolutely fantastic. He's an attorney. He went there straight out of law school, rose up through the ranks. He's a supervisor now. I would love to have him as an asylum officer for any one of my cases. Super smart guy, very serious, knows the law cold. Like this is something that's completely doable and I have no idea why no previous administration has done it. Another question came up um, about um, documentation. Um, does that, uh, in terms of admin and logistics bit, um, is there, has there been an issue with uh, asylum, asylees documentation um, once they come up, um, like that they don't have some sort of, they've made the long journey and um, you run into issues with documentation and getting a certain kind of doc piece of documentation to, to go through and how do you deal with challenges like that? Yeah, it's very challenging. I mean, when, when people are fleeing, like I described my first asylum client that I ever had, and he literally fled with the clothes on his back. I mean, how do you prove? So he was a nurse in his home country. How do I prove he was a nurse? Like, I don't, he didn't bring his diploma. You know, he didn't like grab it off the wall when he was jumping out the back window of his house. So it is a huge challenge. I mean, people are not, when they're running from something, they're not going to like, always take the time to look through their house and pull all the right documents and bring those with them. Um, so sometimes they just have to um, explain to the judge why they don't have the documents. And if they give credible testimony as to why a document is not available, then the judge can accept their testimony if the judge finds it to be truthful in lieu of documents. So a person can win an asylum case, even if they don't have all the documents that they would like to. When I'm handling those cases as an attorney, I encourage the client to reach out to their family members who may still be in the home country to try to gather as much documentation as possible because well-documented cases are more winnable cases just because the judge can see that what the person is saying is truthful. Um, sometimes if the person has resources, if they're well-funded, maybe we could hire an attorney in the home country to try to get some documents, like if they're public records, it's a birth certificate, marriage certificate, divorce, criminal records, something like that. Um, sometimes now we see nonprofits who it's a really interesting new area of nonprofit work that's popped up where we have nonprofits who are going into Central American countries and trying to help people gather documents because the people themselves can't do it, or maybe it's too dangerous for their family members to be seen or heard like soliciting documents. So this nonprofit person goes in instead and asks for it. So that's kind of like a new, a newly evolving area, I think, of like document support for asylum cases. Um, but it's definitely a challenge. What impacts have COVID-19, I mean, how has COVID-19 made um, your job more difficult and made navigating this process um, harder? Yeah, that's a great question because the USCIS, which is the, the agency that conducts all the interviews, whether it's asylum, immigration, green cards, what have you, was, has, was functionally closed um, for close to a year. Uh, people were working from home, but officers are not allowed to take client files home with them. Um, that's against, you know, agency procedure. And you can imagine why. What if they lose something? What if, you know, their house catches on fire or something and a bunch of document, you know, files go up in flames. The U.S. government has an ancient, ancient, ancient system when it comes to immigration in terms of document retention. They're paper files. Like, it's not digitized. 
And so I mentioned earlier, my husband's an attorney as well. I have to hear like a 20 minute lecture from him like every day about how the Biden administration should hire somebody who's really, really good at like digitizing files to come in and digitize the entire immigration system because it's absolutely absurd. I mean, I carry around like my files look like this. Because these are what the government files look like. So my file is the same as the government. You know why? Because when I'm in court, I might not get internet service. I might not be able to look at a digital file. So I have, I have to go into court with one of these bad boys and the government attorney has the same thing. When we have calendar calls, so like maybe 12 or 15 ca cases are heard on the same day just to do scheduling and stuff. They come in with this huge um, cart that's on wheels and they have like, you know, the government attorney, they have like 12 or 15 of these bad boys in this big cart and they come like pushing it in with this. I mean, it's like the most antiquated thing you can imagine. Wait, I completely forgot the question, Eileen. I'm sorry. I got way off on this, on this jag about the digitized files. <laughs> The, the uh, your files like that, that, that made a very big impact though. Um, okay. And I think we were talking about COVID-19, but the okay. fact that you have to okay. pull out some so room things, in your bag okay, so, for that thing. So let's just say things were already slow and old fashioned and, you know, not efficient. Then you shut it down for a year. So it's not like processing times have doubled. Processing times have like quadrupled. So cases that used to take three to six months to process now take two years to process. And what I mean by process is after we finish preparing one of these bad boys and submitting it to the government, and then the government takes, let's say in the past three to six months to make a decision, now they're taking two years to make a decision. So everything is massively backlogged. I only see it getting more backlogged because even now we're seeing if I have um, like if I have court in a couple weeks, it's going to get postponed to October. Nobody's going to court with COVID. The courts are closed. The judges don't want to be there. They don't want to get sick. So everything is shut down. Everything is going to continue to be shut down for a while. The embassies are shut down. So what we're seeing is that the backlog is if the backlog was and it was really bad before COVID. Now it's like, whew, and I took my hand out of the screen on purpose. Like the backlog is just unbelievably massive. So it's gonna take forever for people to get their visas, their green cards, their work permits, their asylum grants, anything and everything that comes from the federal government that, is, that immigrants need to regularize their lives and to just be able to do things like get a job, it's taking forever. And it's gonna to continue to take forever. I have, we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to combine um, three students' questions together. The first is one of our students, Ziomara Virial, who is still on, she's still uh, hung on, and um, Ziomara asks, um, how are you able to legitimize the threats that asylum seekers present to you, um, and how often do you have to turn away clients um, who do not have enough evidence to support their claims? Mm -hmm. um, and somewhat similar to that, um, another student asked, um, how often do you work pro bono, um, if you would like to, if you're willing to answer that? Right. That's a great question. Um, I've always had pro bono as part of my practice, just that's always like been, that's, you know, that's why I left Covington and Burling, right, to come and, you know, start my own little office here in San Diego. It's always been a part of my practice, but as my practice has grown, and I've been able to expand my revenue through corporate clients, then I've been able to take on more pro bono because it's basically subsidizing it. Um, so I have a little bit of a privileged situation in San Diego. I have a five attorney firm. We're about to hire a sixth attorney. Um, we've got some really solid, you know, household name corporate clients that give us a ton of business, which is awesome. So that stabilizes the revenue and allows me to take those like just pure heart, no dollar sign cases. Um, but a lot of practitioners 
are one attorney, they're pure solos. It's just an attorney in an office, maybe with one staff member. Folks like that, they have to get paid for every single case that they have because they're just, they're not gonna be able to survive um, unless, as I said, unless they're independently wealthy or have some super wealthy spouse or something. Like it's just not that realistic. I think most immigration attorneys have one or two pro bono cases going on at any given time just because so many of us are public service minded and that's why we're in this field as opposed to another field. Um, but it is it is definitely um, hard for folks to get free legal services. It's a huge challenge. One of the really good things though about the last um, four years is that because Trump was so bad on immigration, like so kind of like comic book villain on it, that people like actually woke up and realized like, oh my God, this is awful how these people are being treated. The truth is they were still being treated horribly during Obama, Bush, you know, the, the whole, like it's been Clinton, it's been awful the whole time, but people woke up to it because, I mean, Trump was like a parody of, of, of himself on immigration. Um, and then a ton of money kind of donations started pouring in the States, many States started realizing like, oh my God, we have to fund this work. Like our, our residents, like in California, the residents of California are being terrorized. This is horrible. So the government of California made a ton of money available. So the nonprofits have actually been well-funded, but th this is a recent phenomenon. So that's been a good thing. Um, in terms of documentation, um, I don't really turn down cases if they don't have documents. If I believe that they are credible and their story hangs together. There are some times when people come in um, and I talk to them and I question them and I do a full hour long, sometimes more, like more than one hour consultation before I agree to take a case. If I don't believe them, I'm not going to take their case. And I'm, I've become pretty good just through my experience doing this for 19 years of anticipating what questions the government's going to ask. And if I, and I'll take them through it in the consult. And if they can't give me a solid answer, I won't take the case. Um, I had like, I, I, I am not a person who's so naive that I think that there aren't fraudulent cases out there. There are fraudulent cases. So you have to be a really good attorney to sort of try to suss that out from the beginning. And sometimes clients will fool you. I'll tell you that for sure. Um, but I don't get fooled very often because just at this point in my career, because I'm just, I've got a really good like built-in BS detector for cases. And I know a lot about the country conditions. And if it's a country I'm not familiar with, I'll read the country conditions before the person comes in. So I'll know if what they're telling me kind of rings true and is consistent with the country conditions or not. Um, but you'd be surprised. I mean, I'd say that like for people who come in seeking asylum um, and if they either it's a pro bono case or if they have the money, um, I'd say 80% of the time I take the case because I do believe the person. There are some cases, there's there there are some people where it's it doesn't hang together. And that includes potential pro bono cases. We do our own research. We'll look them up on Facebook and social media. And sometimes we find out people are lying about things and then we don't take the case. Thank you so much, um, Ginger. We're at 7.35. Um, so we're going to go ahead and 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 close the discussion. Um, but I, I saved the chat, I mean, because there was so much good feedback uh, from our students. Um, they really appreciated your perspective. Um, I actually heard my favorite comment was that um, this is one of the only classes that I'm actually happy I went to. I wasn't forced to go to. Um, so we just have like a, a, a nice little uh, collection of really great feedback. Um, and we thank you so much for, for your time um, and for your um, all of the, the service that you've provided to people um, that are trying to navigate this very complex uh, immigration system. Um, and so we definitely hope to, to stay in touch with you um, here at the Bush School and, you know, and maybe be able to talk to you down the road. Um, I would be delighted. I, I would be delighted. I love speaking with students. I love speaking with people who are intellectually curious, who are you know, aware, active, um, interested. So please invite me back, um, maybe at some point in the future. 
Um, I'm fully vaccinated now, so you know maybe I'll translate come on campus. We transition like, over to our in-person component. I mean, this would be a lot more fun to to have this. Um, discussion in person. Um, but I, I want to reiterate, and we've talked about this um, in the past, Ginger. Uh, I mean, a lot of times we see asylum seekers as kind of this buzzword in the news, but we don't really kind of think to unpack the concept. Um, yeah. So we really appreciate you coming and, and shedding more, more light on that. And uh, I thank you all who have, who are still in the audience. We had uh, at one point, um, over 130. Um, and, you know, now we have 22 that have stuck through the end. So I appreciate everyone who, who stayed until the end. Um, and I mean, the time flew by for me. So I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much. My parents are still on. So hi, mom and dad. Actually, my parents are also on. Uh, hi, mom and dad. Absolutely. So um, yeah.